ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Paolo Volpin. I'm the interim dean of the business school, formerly CAS. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event today. Uh, with more than 50 years of history, we are a leading global business school driven by world-class research that matters for the business community and guides our education philosophy. Located in the heart of London, the school has strong links to both the city of London and the entrepreneurial hub of Tech City. Uh, the school educates nearly 4,000 students each year on uh, globally renowned programs across all levels of study, including undergraduate, postgraduate, and executive education. On graduating, uh, our students join a strong alumni community of almost 50,000 people in more than 160 countries. Uh, one word maybe about our name, given the way in which I presented it to you, uh, from 2002 to 2020, the school uh, was named CAS Business School, following a donation from the Sir John CAS Foundation, an educational charity. Now, in, in July 2020, we took the decision to remove the CAS name, uh, following the news that slave trade uh, was the source of Sir John CAS's wealth. Now, this decision was an important statement uh, about the school's value. And so now we have started a process to find an appropriate new name that will better represent our values and help us continue to grow in reputation. Until then, we are the business school for Merle Cass. As already mentioned, our goal as a business school is to produce knowledge that has real world impact. For this purpose, we rely on research centers as the medium for engagement with the business world. A great example is today's event, which is organized by the Center for Banking Research, uh, which promotes topical and high quality research in banking. Uh, founded in 2008, the uh, Center for Banking Research builds on a long history of banking research at the school and has the mission to disseminate cutting edge research and engage with a wide array of stakeholders through publications, workshops, and events like this one. Now, the speaker today is Jose Manuel Campa, who is currently the chairperson of the European Banking Authority. He, has, he was between 2015 and 2019 global head of regula regulatory affairs for the Group of Santander, and previously a professor of financial management and international economics at the Yeze Business School. Between 2009 and 2011, Professor Campa also served as Secretary of State for the Economy in the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Finances. He was a member of the Financial Stability Board, the Board of the European Financial Stability Facility, and the Economic and Financial Committee. He has wide experience teaching strategy and financial management courses in financial institutions like Goldman Sachs, Citibank, ABNN, AMRO, uh, WB, BBVA, and Santander, and in academic institutions like IESE, the Stern School of Business of New York University, Harvard University, and Columbia University. He published many influential papers and has been a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and he is still a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Professor Campa has also been a consultant to a large number of international organizations, including the International Monetary Fund, the International, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and the European Commission. He has also served uh, in the Likanen uh, group of experts who evaluated policy recommendations on structural reforms for the European banking industry. Now, given the extraordinary mix of high profile academic and professional experiences, my expectation is that we are in for a great keynote speech today. So without further delay, let, let me welcome you again to this event and leave you in the capable hands of Professor Barbara Kazu, who is the director of the Center for Banking Research and will tell you about their latest project. Uh, thank you all for attending. Barbara. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about this uh, Conduct Cost Project. So the Conduct Cost Project is a result of research carried out by our team that includes many people, so a lot of work has gone into it. The project started back in 2012 at the London School of Economics. It was then passed on to the uh, Conduct Cost uh, Foundation, the CCP Foundation, 
which was led by um, Roger McCormick and Chris Steers, which hopefully are here in the audience. And they were helped by uh, Tanya Duarte, who has also been doing uh, uh, the large majority of the uh, data work and research work in putting together this report. So what is the aim of the report? The aim of the report is to try and improve transparency in financial activity. Banks had a very big hit to their reputation back in 2007, 2008, but that wasn't the end of, of their trouble. A lot of banking scandals uh, happened uh, from the PPE scandal uh, to the uh, LIBOR uh, manipulation benchmarking to the fixing of exchange rates. Banks have been constantly under the spotlights and conduct risk has become really important for banks, shareholders and other stakeholders as the level of conduct costs has been increasing. However, it is really difficult to find any clear and transparent way to compare banks along several metrics of bank conduct costs so that include not only the fines, but the conduct of the bank in, in general, which includes the uh, governance, which includes various other things that we would see. So the final aim of our report is to promote a more ethical culture in financial firms. So what do we do here? We have collected data uh, on conduct costs for the world's largest uh, 20, uh, bank, the, for the 20 largest banks. And as we can see, uh, the uh, conduct costs peaked around about in 2014, 2015. This is the height of the various scandals I have been describing. They have be been decreasing since, but they are still stubbornly high. So the questions we are asking, and hopefully we will discuss with our keynote speaker, is do we still need to worry about bank conduct? And what are the key risks and key challenging, challenges for regulators to set standards for bank conduct? The report goes a little bit beyond the costs. We look at the causes. For example, most of the uh, conduct costs for UK banks were related to mis-selling, uh, be it mortgage mis-selling, PPI mis-selling, but also money, money laundering related costs. For euro area banks, uh, the majority of the cost also related to market abuse and manipulation, including manipulation of benchmarks. Uh, uh, for example, we said the LIBOR scandals, but also to anti-money laundering issues and the breach of economic sanction. Slightly different, the causes for US banks, uh, the largest reasons for US banks to incur conduct costs, uh, again, were related to mortgage mis-selling and market manipulation. How are things uh, uh, in terms of what are the main uh, reasons? So it's not only fine and penalties. So we collect a lot of data in, in a very granular and very detailed way. And we can see that the fines, so the fines that regulators impose on banks are only around 18% of all the conduct costs. A lot of the conduct costs relate to regulatory, uh, regulatory redress, which are various issues that banks discuss with regulators most of these might not end up making the headlines and what we are arguing is that there is little transparency between you know the big hit with the fine making the headlines and the actual costs for misconducts uh, that banks uh, face. Um, another thing that just to give you a flavor of, of what we do I don't really want to take up too much time is the culpability code and ethicality. So what we look into is what caused uh, the breach, the regulatory breach, what caused the fine, what caused the bank to engage with regulators to try and, and redress some breach of regulation. And here we see how the landscape has changed uh, since 2008. So in 2008, the majority of, of fines were due to corporate uh, misconduct or behavioral failure. But, but now we are talking about more 
integrity related regulatory breaches without going into the ins and outs of, of the legal definition of the terms is that banks are incurring different uh, if a different type in different type of problems so we want to uh, go into details to be able to offer to banks regulators shareholders investors a benchmark of how banks are behaving which is not just the fines they pay so what are we want what do we want to do next we have built a comprehensive data set on these uh, 20 banks um, that tries to add context to the conduct costs and also an insight into a bank's non-financial performance the next step include to update the data set and expand the data set to more than the 20 banks we have now um, it is very important that the data set is kept updated. There are a lot of challenges, uh, for example, in these very stressful COVID times uh, where regulatory oversight might not be as strict as it was before. We are planning to focus mainly on European banks. Uh, the reason why we want to do so is because uh, the European banking sector is still fairly fragmented with different regulatory authorities uh, um, uh, using different approaches uh, on how they deal with uh, banks uh, misbehavior some of them are still not making the data public so there is still a need to have comparable data uh, across european banks and again we want to develop a conduct costs index to be able to benchmark banks uh, um, on their uh, conduct pretty much in the same way they are now benchmarked uh, against the ESG indicators. The report presents all this that hopefully does a better job than I have done in, in a few minutes. You can download the report on the Banking Centre website. This is the address. But the report and the launch of this work was also to set the scene for our keynote uh, with, who will tell us what the uh, European regulators have done and uh, I will leave the uh, floor to Mr. Kampa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Yes, well, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, congratulations on the report, first of all. And uh, thank you to the, to the involved team for his initial remarks and uh, my introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with you today here uh, so that we can discuss these issues of, of conduct or misconduct of banks, which I think are fundamental to the well being and the well functioning of our financial economy, and particularly our banking system. So, you know, first of all, I would like to congratulate. Uh, the, the business school and the center, the research center for the work that they do. I think this is very important work, work and a work that uh, I really appreciate and we at the EBA follow closely. You know, and I also want to, to thank uh, Rima Yadi, who is a, a professor at the school that I'm sure you all know very well for all the work that she does also for the EBA, helping us tremendously. She's been the chair of our banking stakeholder group, which is our key group, contact group with the stakeholders in the in the industry that help us make sure that we balance our regulation and our activities to take into account the impact on all stakeholders, the representatives of industry, the representatives of consumer organizations, of different bank models, and as well of academics in the field. And Rin has been doing a tremendous job uh, chairing this group, and, and but really, I really appreciate personally, but I think the whole EBA appreciates the work that she's done for us. So let me first let you know, you know, for those of you that don't know, don't know that the European Banking Authority, you know, was set up in 2011 as a response of the 2008 global financial crisis. It was part of a number of supervisory authorities that were created at the European level in banks, securities and insurance and a macro supervisor. Uh, we are in charge, you know, very much on strengthening the prudential framework for banks. But we also have an important and complementary role with regards to conduct and the protection of EU citizens. And this manifests itself in a direct way, in a direct mandate that we have, and also in an indirect way. But just to give you a sense, in the funding regulation of the EBA, it is recognized that consumer detriment can impact financial stability, 
and I, I make a note that the only substructure with an explicit mandate in the area in this area when the ABA was created is a mandate of a standing committee on consumer protection and financial innovation. So that I think sends a clear signal of how important this area is for us. You know? The ABA regulation also makes a direct link between market integrity and conduct issues, such as institutions failures to prevent financial crime, you know, and that's addressed also through a new mandate that we have received since the beginning of this year you know, to lead, coordinate, and monitor anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism and countering terror the financing of terrorism across the European Union. We're also mandated to support various EU directives and regulations uh, that are aimed at mitigating issues for consumers arising from misconduct of financial institutions, you know, in areas uh, as diverse as payments, mortgage credits, you know, these are clear examples of where with mandates uh, you know, and it points to our direct interest in mitigating the risks of misconduct to protect the well-being of EU citizens in their interaction with financial institutions. Now, equally <coughs> important to this indirect, to equally important to these direct mandates, it's also an indirect obligation that falls within the overall obligation to the EBA to monitor and address conduct risks through its prudential and financial stability mandates. One straight way forward to understanding this is to look at the cost of misconducts in recent years. And you know, we just, uh, Professor Cast presented the, out, the results of, of the study that has been performed there, you know, and all the studies vary depending on how costs are measured. You know, I am aware that you have better granular numbers even David than we do, you know, among the city's business faculty on, on the impact of these numbers. And I very much encourage you to continue on this line of work and, and fully share your concluding remarks saying that you know that, that the fragmentation in some of this conduct uh, regulation across the European Union and different policies pursued by different national authorities in this area makes it sometimes difficult to aggregate and have clear information on this front. So I very much encourage you to continue this line of work. You know, but but if I just look at your report, you basically highlight that between 2008 and December 2018, you know, the 20 large international banks that you mentioned, you know, uh, have Pay conduct costs in excess, in, in excess of 377 billion pounds. You know, other other studies, you know, and the ECB has come forward with a similar study recently as well, point to to uh, similar orders of magnitude. So I think I, I don't need to convince you that misconduct costs hit profits and potentially capital, and potential regulators, potential regulators want to make sure that you know, the misconduct does not affect uh, prudential requirements, also does not affect financial stability ultimately. No? So beyond this, I think there are more subtle reasons why prudential regulations, regulators also need to be concerned by misconduct. You know? uh, this trust on the reliability of the financial system is a crucial for proper, for proper functioning and misconduct issues directly target you know, uh, that, that trust in the financial system. So I think that in this context, you know, effective structures on sound internal governance arrangements, I'll come back this to all my remarks, you know, are fundamental for financial inst institutions and the system overall to operate well. You know. Financial crime and misconduct also under undermines the trust in the entire system and causes also additional ways, uh, additional harm beyond the, the financial system strictly such as tax evasion or terrorist financing, as I mentioned before. So, you know, uh, I think more generally also the expectations of our societies around this risk and the public scrutiny have been growing on all corporations, including financial institutions. And this, I, I would say, it's also reflected in, you know, what I would consider the growing acceptance that corporations overall, including banks, have uh, in the responsibility to multiple stakeholders beyond shareholders, you know, including their customers, the staff, and society. And last year we saw a very significant initiative from a very large a sample of very large US corporations along this way. So I would say, you know, that our direct and indirect conduct mandates are mutually reinforcing and are accompanied by, you know, our conduct tools, which I will try to describe to you below, you know, what, what are the tools in which uh, we currently rely on to address these issues. However, you know, the scale of the misconduct issues of recent years and growing societal pressure, you know, also are even more salient 
in a time of digital acceleration, you know, so the, because this increases the challenges in tackling misconduct in a number of new ways. You know, that means we need to consider now not, solo, not only the toolkit that we have, but how to develop that toolkit further, you know, how to combine those tools with, with better addressing emerging themes, which are referred to in FinTech and ESG, you know, to make the, the, the change. You know, as I said, you are aware, I'm aware that you, that you have access to many examples of misconducts and insights into associ the associated drivers and costs that this will rely on. And the presentation that we just heard is an, is an example of this. So I'm not going to dwell on, the, on these past cases, you know, but uh, I think that also I will not, we should not be thinking only how to address past issues, but also think about how, you know, look into the future using the knowledge of chips we're seeing today to reflect on where the potential issues of conduct will arise in the coming months and years. You know? So to that end, and as a starting point, allow me to identify two hot areas, or I consider to be them now hot areas, that we're currently concerned and believe we should be building our defenses against now, you know, uh, because they are becoming more and more severe. The first one I will point to is uh, the treatment that customers are receiving now during the pandemic, you know, especially as they engage with banks on adjusting their payment schedules through loan moratoria. You know, we, we have identified uh, in, our, in our prudential work relevant moratoria criteria and clarified that moratoria loans should not automatically be reclassified for prudential purpose and therefore should not automatically impact consumers' credit rating. However, disagreements are happening very fast and in a massive scale. You know, so I have been worried about ensuring that all consumers know what they're getting into as they get into these moratoriums and they're treated fairly by their institutions. That is why we at the ABA supported, you know, not just this potential work on moratoria, but also call for fair and transparent treatment of consumers and have also worked with the European Commission in supporting financial institutions and consumer groups to identify a set of best practice in terms of consumer treatment that the Commission has published and put forward. You know? And I think this is an important part of the agenda. As the moratoria has run out and as the situation normalizes, moratoria after all should be considered an exceptional measure. You know, it would be imperative that this full transparency and fair treatment of consumers, both for uh, renegotiating existing and for uh, arranging new loans. You know, banks need to ensure that they have good governance and risk management and I think in that sense, you know, we have published some guidelines on what we consider good governance and adhere to God. those guidelines should be very important. The second salient risk that I think is important that we keep in mind, you know, relates to the rapid acceleration of, digitaliz of the digitalization agenda. And also, as I said, as, a, as linked to the previous one, this has increased at an accelerated rate through the pandemic or due to the pandemic. You know, I, as I say, it's an, it's, it's an acceleration of an existing trend, but I think that overnight customers across the European Union have turned to digital financial service and costly payments, very often contactless, and of course this offers high potential benefits for consumers in terms of, of, of cost and convenience, but beyond your these immediate developments and benefits, we need to be guard on several areas in this, in this aspect, and I just highlight four. You know, first, access to financial services needs to continue. You know, digitalization offers many benefits, but at the same time, we must be cognizant that there are consumers who cannot or choose not to use technology for the financial services. And it's important that we make sure that those are individuals are not left behind. Second aspect is an increase in online fraud. You know, our observations at these states are anecdotal, you know, but the Council of Europe has already identified specific increases in fraud in relation to medical equipment, to economic relief measures, and also to financial aspect. So I think it's important that we keep that in mind and that we enhance our fraud prevention skills and risk management in institutions. Third part, I think that, you know, <coughs> it's important that the consumer's understanding of the online transaction risks and the new products that are coming up in this digitalization agenda, you know, keep up with the pace of change. And I think here, you know, we need to be concerned that banks should have proper oversight and governance and transparency on, but also to properly equip, you know, consumers to have a better understanding. You know, uh, last year, we had the EBA produce a guide for consumers, which was translated to all official languages, 
of outlining ways to stay safe when choosing online banking services and make sure that the key characteristics of those services and the key features were provided to consumers. And I think a lot more needs to be done along that area. Finally, and I think this is obvious for everybody, you know, we need to have an increased focus on cybersecurity you know, and digital operational resilience as we continue to move in this digitalization track. Now, let me, let me focus a few minutes on the tools, as it was suggested before, that the EBA has at its disposal. You know, they're primarily legal instruments in which we have articulated requirements in order to mitigate conduct risk and strengthen sense governance and risk management. Let me first start with the tools related to our indirect mandate that I mentioned before, which focuses, as I say, on general governance and risk culture of credit institutions. Then I will explain, you know, the specific tools that we have for specific aspects, mainly, you know, AML, conduct, consumers, and then I'll follow, consumer fraud, and then I'll follow, I'll finish with a comment on financial education. So on governance and risk culture, you know, this has been a key area of focus for us since the financial crisis in 2007 started. You know, I think it's clear to everybody that at that time, internal governance issues, you know, uh, had been uh, at the focus of uh, the, some of the key problems in the crisis. I think that a lot has been done by institutions over their governance, the risk culture, and the risk management in the last decade. You know, but however, I also think that room for improvement remains. Let me start for, uh, for us, you know, what does it mean to have appropriate governance and strong risk culture? You know, and that for us means they should include at least the following features. First, an adequate what we call tone from the top. The management body, which is the responsible for setting and communicating the institution's core values and expectations should be, you know, jointly with the top management, the leading by example and monitor and adjust the risk culture of the credit institution as needed at all levels of the organization. And this is very important that that tone from the top is clearly reflected. Second aspect is accountability. I think relevant staff at all levels should know and understand the core values of the credit institution and also to the extent necessary for their role, the risk appetites and the risk capacity that institutions is willing to engage in any of these issues. Third aspect is effective communication, you know, and challenge within the organization. I think that a culture of open communication, democratic management styles that allow for effective challenge, you know, in which the decision-making processes stimulate a constructive critical attitude within the organization, it's a good environment to try to detect these risks. And finally, you know, incentives. I think incentives are important, you know, including clear performance criteria for bonuses, clear consequences when mis misconduct play a key role, and also aligning behavior of staff with the institution's risk profile and its long-term goals should be important. Now, we at ABA support that the development of institutions good government, risk culture, and risk management is fundamental, and we do that through a series of guidelines on governance arrangements. You know, these guidelines that we put forward highlight what we consider good governance practices, including you know, the principles that I mentioned before, also what are clear organizational structures with well-defined, transparent, and consistent lines of responsibilities. As I said before, making sure that the incentives are adequate and compatible, and that there are adequate controls mechanisms in place. We're also focusing beyond just the, these four principles on issues of operational resilience in the context of an increase use of, outsider, of outsourcing, part of the digitalization trend that I mentioned before. You know, some of them provided not just by third parties, but also from third countries, which is an additional issue of concern. In addition to our regulatory work, you know, in our toolkit, then we have the supervisors who monitor and supervisors the bank's governance, risk culture, and management through what we call the SREP, the Supervisory Review and Evaluation Process. This is REP, it comes out of our guidelines that were provided by the EBA to provide a common framework for those assessments. And in their assessments of internal governments, you know, prudential supervisors assess if the, if the institution has an appropriate and transparent corporate structure that's fit for purpose. So that's about our indirect mandate. Let me tell you a little bit about our toolkits in, the, in our direct mandates, particularly in the area first of retail conduct. You know, this is the conduct of firms towards consumers. And here we have assessed the detriment arising to consumers from the past misconduct of firms. You know, this was highlighted in the cost in, of, of misconduct that were highlighted in the report uh, that we saw before. And we have issued as a result of that a number of technical standards and guidelines 
you know, to, to try to address these issues. Some of these are, for instance, guidelines on product oversight and governance that they prompt senior management of conduct institutions to consider conduct related, related issues when developing and distributing new products. That's very important. You know, other standards that address the security of payment services across the union. You know, we are also working now with national authority, authorities to ensure that you know, not those rules are adequately supervised and that the requirements that we have developed in a way are, are supervised in a way that is effective and to ensure consistency across you know, the union as a, as, as the, at the same time that we guarantee consistently, uh, consistency in high outcomes for consumers. We will also assess, you know, as we go forward, and we're in the middle of this now, how we can mess, best use of our new powers that we received, as I mentioned before, on January 1st of this year, you know, uh, to coordinate national mystery shopping activities. This new power that we have, and that we're now in the process of figuring out the best way to use it and develop it. Then let me move on also to our direct tools on email conduct. Here I mentioned before again that on January 1st, you know, of this year, we got a new mandate on the AML. You know, now we have uh, the role to <coughs> lead, coordinate, and monitor the implementation of AML activities across the EU. For us, you know, this uh, has to go beyond what's a box ticking exercise, you know, but it has to be embedded in which, again, in the culture in which financial crime is not acceptable, regardless of profits at institutions. To that end, we have developed so far two major products, you know, guidelines on what does it mean to have risk-based AML supervision. And this sets out how authorities should carry out an effective risk-based approach to monitor the AML CFT and assess the risks, including that, again, here, the integrity of senior management. In addition, we have generated a guidelines also on AML risk factors, you know, which are addressed to financial institutions to equip them on how to make informed and proportionate decisions on the effective management of, of money laundering and financing and financing of terrorism risks, which are associated with individual transactions. Finally, in this area, as I said at the uh, uh, prior, prior uh, on January 1st, you know, we received this enhanced legal mandate to coordinate, lead, and monitor the EU's efforts in financial, in fighting financial crime across the financial sector. For us, this involves a long line of work, you know, which has a conduct element. For instance, the creation of a central AML CFT database with information from regional, national, regional and national authorities on weaknesses they identify in governance arrangements or in fitness and proper assessments of individuals that are, that are in a board or senior management responsibilities at individual institutions. You know, now we need to ensure that this information is shared with relevant authorities and it will also inform our own work and our own approaches going forward. Finally, we have published as part of our consultation work, you know, our views on strengthening the existing legal framework on AML and CFT in the EU to improve AML conduct you know, across the union. Here we provided advice to the European Union, which as you know, is currently proposing, uh, it's currently, it has just finished a consultation on how best to enhance a regulatory framework and a supervisory framework at the European level but to enhance that we'll have proper principles, proper regulation, proper authorities, proper powers, and efficient supervision across the union. Now, finally, in these areas of, of direct responsibility, let me just one word on financial education. You know, uh, financial education and financial literacy are by no means, I think, a substitute for the conduct requirements that I have just presented but I think they're very useful complement to such requirements. You know, this is because, and, and speaking here at a business school, you know, I think this, this may be obvious, but it's nevertheless, I think, important to emphasize it. You know, financial education and literacy empower consumers. It gives them the knowledge and the skills needed to understand the legal rights and obligations, as well information about the future, the features, risks, and opportunities of using financial products and services. You know, I think education and financial literacy make it possible that the arms of conduct and transparency requirements imposed on financial institutions can actually materialize and be effective. In that sense, you know, we at the EBA, we're coordinating all of this work. And for instance, we're having a financial education uh, session similar to this one with a, with a panel and with a large number of stakeholders at the end of this month. And we think this is one area in which more work uh, needs to be done to enhance all of our citizens 
across the union. Now, let me now turn you know, to our ongoing work to strengthen this toolkit that I just talked about in relationship to conduct. You know, in particular, the idea I would like to emphasize and to discuss is how can we integrate and combine our various tools that I've been mentioning to really push change in the institutions, you know, whether it be on the traditional issues such as preventing AML risks or on the emerging things, which I'll come back to at the end of my talk of 15 of FinTech and ESG, and how can we those be harnessed, you know, to prevent that this conduct arises. Now, from my view, to maximize the synergies between the various supervisory authorities, what's important is that our regulatory products, and we're really pushing this at the ABA, are consistent and integrated were needed, you know, so that the findings from different supervisory activities, from different inspections being done by the Prudential Authority, by the Conduct Authority, or by the AML Authority, which in many national jurisdictions, as you all know, they may, they may be or they're likely to be under three different agents, you know, are shared, they're well aware of all the other authorities of what's going on, you know, and that it provides a consistent and integrated uh, view, you know, to allow uh, an integrated approach as well by the supervisor in the supervision of institutions. Here, for instance, I have in mind as, a, as, as an enhancement of our toolkit, you know, an example which is the current EBA guidelines that we produce on loan origination. You know, these guidelines traditionally will be a, lo a lot of uh, prescriptions or indications, you know, uh, on how best to cover potential requirements, usually on credit related risks. You know, however, on the new guidelines that we issued this year, we didn't stop just there, but we also capture, you know, in how the guidelines should take into account in the process of loan origination issues on consumer protection. Let me be sure, as I, said, as I mentioned before, that the consumer is well informed, that it's proper, the product being offered is proper to the, to the consumer and the situation of the consumer, but also on ESG issues and on, and on the AML objectives. So all these three objectives, you know, are included side by side, I would say on an equal footing to the traditional credit-related credit risk assessment when a new loan gets originated. I see this combination approach, you know, being continued going forward in more products that we develop. Of course, in this, we need to be mindful at the same time of the different responsibilities of prudential supervisors. As I mentioned before, you know, prudential supervisors, AML, conduct supervisors are likely to be uh, different authorities in different member countries with a specific mandates, but I still think that there's, there are touch points between them and that the different supervisory roles and good coordination among them and a holistic view is of the essence to make sure that we do proper regulation and also at the end proper supervision. So along these lines, we you know, will be working to, to combine conduct related issues into our SREP methodology to raise aware among prudential supervisors the weaknesses in internal governance and controls frameworks can be exploited for money laundering or for terrorist financing purposes. You know, also in the business model analysis, for example, of institutions, we think it's important that, you know, financial successful business models are at the same time, you know, consistent with limited risk and avoiding, you know, increased risk in money laundering or terrorist finance, you know, that other types of services may be. Uh, are uh, given rise to. You know, we, we are all aware that sometimes these lines of business may be profitable, but may be risky in the third dimension, so we need to have that trade-off clear as we go forward. Now, finally, and as a reflection on the increased focus on social issues, I think we will, all, we will also be providing new guidance on issues such as gender-neutral remuneration policies to assure that institutions take the necessary measures to avoid discrimination and to guarantee equal opportunities and inclusion to staff of all genders and diversity. And I think this is another area in which is important. But uh, I'm conscious of time, and I would like to, you know, uh, say a few words before I finish on these emerging themes of fintech and ESG and conduct on these areas, which I think are very important. You know, here, as you know, we, we as regulators face a large number of emerging sector-wide themes, you know, which pose for us uh, not just the traditional so a risk approach and obviously financial stability concerns that we'll be looking at, but also conduct related risks, but at the same time also offer opportunities to further strengthen the toolkit that we have. And I think it's important that we try to maximize on those opportunities. Notably, I would say, you know, technology of FitTech, you know, has provided us with like rec tech tools and sub tech for supervisory activities, tools that will allow us to enhance our toolkit, you know, but at the same time, 
you know, we have gotten as part of our regulatory framework, both in the area of FinTech and ESG, you know, a broad set of mandates that we need to work on. Let me first start by noting that the, the, what I said before about the rapid acceleration of the digital world, you know, we have lived through 2020, it's a vital consideration for us as we think of future conduct. And I already gave you an example before of the concerns that we raised earlier this year as the pandemic exploded. But, you know, as we think of increased digitization in the EU financial sector, you know, uh, opportunities are raised and risks. You know? I think that uh, we need to ensure that the concept for us is very important of technological neutrality that we're trying to embed in all our regu regulation. It's also embedded in our approach to our, uh, when we think about consumers, you know, and when we think about how consumers get affected by this. So for instance, you know, uh, in the accordance with that principle, you know, I think that consumers should always benefit from the same and high standards of protection, you know, when accessing financial services, whether it's through digital means or through more, through more traditional intermediation channels. As an example of this, I would say, you know, that disclosures of pre-control and contractual information must effectively be conveying the risk of a financial product service, regardless of the channel in which they're distributed. Uh, they're distributed on a digital channel or on a more traditional distribution channel. Same way, you know, as, a, as artificial intelligence applications for credit scoring and robot advice become more and more prevalent, we need to ensure that our approach is consumer-centric and that it guards against the risk of unfair bias being built into the system or to ensure explainability into these models at all times, you know. We already have signaled in this in a report that we published on big data and advanced analytics er er earlier in this year, you know, that the solution entails a strong and consistent framework for oversight and regulation to assure that this ethical and secure use of data is fundamental as well as the avoidance of biases as the, as the uh, methods and, and these artificial intelligence new systems develop. On the ESG front, our work currently is focused on climate change, you know, but I think social fa factors have taken greater prominence and also wider sustainability factors beyond climate change like biodiversity for a variety of obvious reasons through this year. So uh, this also includes other aspects that uh, may not be as prominent in, in everybody's agenda, but I think as I mentioned before, it's very important for us, like focus on workers' treatment, you know, and the importance of demonstrating a commitment to diversity in the workforce and throughout the supply chain. So this brings with it at the same time, the very real risk, the very real risks, you know, that again, biases arise or in the issue of, for instance, of, of climate change, you know, the green or social wash in the other issues, you know, may become more and more prevalent. And this would, this would be a potential for misconduct risk going forward. So in that sense, we need to use our ESG toolkit to address these risks. You know, whether that be ensuring that our classifications and definitions to taxonomies are practical and adhere to, or by the verifying that the regime, you know, is checked by verifiers to make sure that it's robust. Still, for us, the key intersection of our GSU work with our conduct work starts with the potential for enhanced transparency around institutions' stated strategy on ESG issues, and this will inevitably sign a light on their approach to conduct as we go forward. Let me finish because I've already spoken for, for quite a long time. And I really look forward to the dialogue and the conversation that we'll have afterwards, which I think probably will be the most interesting part for all of us. You know, conduct matters to the EBA, if I were to conclude, you know, matter, conduct matters very much, both because of our immediate direct responsibilities towards EU citizens, and also, as I said before, because our indirect prudential mandate on financial stability as well. We have done a lot, but we can do better and we can do more. And I think especially as conduct risks change with the acceleration of digitalization and as the public appetite for banks to demonstrate good conduct is growing, our challenge continues to be high. We have a wide range of tools in place, which we will continue to use going forward in conjunction with the other EU supervisory authorities that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, ESMA, which is the security regulator and IOPA, which is the insurance regulator, but as well with the commission and all other EU entities that are engaged in the, in the financial regulatory and supervisory landscape. But importantly, you know, for us, we have an opportunity to combine our tools and ensure that conduct-related aspects are integrated into our, all our work where it matters. 
our experience of combining consumer issues into long origination guidelines that I mentioned before, our efforts to integrate AML considerations into broader governance guidelines, you know, and as I just said, the importance of, consumer, of a consumer-centric approach in fintech regulation and the visibility that ESG considerations will provide mean that we should expect regulators and supervisors to be looking harder at conduct going forward and in a more holistic way. I expect also a positive re response from regulated institutions to be taking these aspects very much at the core of the risk management and values as in, cult in, in their cultures and in their organizations. Thank you very much for the Business School for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, congratulations on the work that they do, and I look forward to the dialogue, but also to the further insights that the research center will provide us going forward. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you so much for this very thoughtful speech. A lot to think about for us banking researcher. You touched on, on so many things. But for now, let me uh, call upon my colleague Rima Yadi to lead the uh, question and answer with you. And let me invite uh, all attendees to post questions in the uh, Q&A um, chat line so that we can have some Q&A with the public as well. Thank you. Rim. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Thank you for this great speech, Jose Manuel. I think it's always inspiring to, uh, to listen to you. Um, I have a few questions based on the discussion and the uh, uh, on your speech uh, today. Uh, first of all, uh, the conduct risk, uh, reputational risk, and also uh, operational risks are all correlated. I mean, uh, one links to the other. Uh, my question to you, should there be a capital requirement uh, to uh, cover all these risks together? So far, I mean, there is one capital, uh, uh, there is capital requirements for operational risk. But then it's not explicitly, at least to my knowledge, uh, linking uh, to uh, the reputational and to the conduct risks. So this is my first question. Uh, my second question, you mentioned uh, the business model analysis, and you know that uh, business model, it's a very interesting uh, topic of research for uh, banking researchers. Obviously, conduct risk uh, assessment is essential when we link it to the bank business model analysis. Do you see, for example, that certain business models are much more prone to uh, conduct risks? For example, if we take uh, banks that are more international, uh, more systemic, uh, and they are investment oriented, so they have to deal with different jurisdictions, so the probability of conduct risk is higher. But at the same time, small banks, which are having much less of a risk management uh, or risk, uh, so more sophisticated risk management, they might also be prone to more conduct risk uh, because of also uh, linking this, as you mentioned, to the governance of these institutions. And sometimes uh, the role of education of the, at governance uh, level and management level, it's extremely important. Uh, and this is also something to be, uh, to be, uh, uh, looking at in the overall business model uh, assessment. Uh, the third point you also mentioned, uh, the uh, digitalization, but of course with digitalization, FinTech, RegTech and all of this, uh, cybersecurity risks increase, online finance related risks increase. Uh, should also all of this uh, would increase the magnitude of the conduct risk. So before, before digitalization uh, uh, and transformation into this digital world, the, there is conduct risk, but with, with the digital economy and so on, the, the magnitude of the conduct risk is increasing. So of course, this w might have uh, implications on uh, overall systemic risk. And my fourth point to you is, you mentioned the ESG and sustainable finance. Uh, up to now, the approach has been quite positive and very constructive, but don't you think that the non-compliance to ESG factors in the medium to long run could also be linked to misconduct? Uh, and I think this is my uh, last point uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Well, Rin, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, as, as usual and as always, you know, very much on the mark very poignant, not simple, uh, and not just a few, but uh, <laughs> a number of them. So 
uh, you show that you're in top shape, as always. But let me try to address them, okay? So the first one, you know, you mentioned uh, conduct, reputational, operational are integrated. I, I think that's very clear the case. And I think many times, you know, I, I would say sometimes you do see situations in which, you know, like at the end, a conduct or reputational risk arises, materializes due to operational deficiencies or due to sometimes, you know, what I would call more than operational, sometimes it's just purely uh, inadequate of the organization to adequate, adequately transmit the key values and purposes of the organization and the key culture that the organization wants to implement. You know, a typical example in that aspect will be, you know, like uh, focus too much on, on, on short-term reasons may lead to, you know, uh, let's, let's execute a sale tomorrow or today, let's execute a transaction today. Who cares about whether this comes back with a negative reputation in two, three quarters or two, three years? So these are obviously interrelated. Now you ask about whether there should be uh, a capital surcharge. I, I, I think that prior to that, what I think that certainly there should be is there should be a prudential assessment of those risks by the prudential supervisor, which obviously ultimately is the one that is in charge of putting the capital surcharge in the context of a pillar two requirement, something like that. And then we have very much encouraging that idea. And this is one aspect in which I think is important. You know, for, for, for two reasons. First, as you say, you know, obviously some of these operational reputation are already explicitly taken into account in, the, in, this, in this pillar two assessment and in the supervised potential supervisory assessment. You know, all, but also as a matter of experience and, and coming back to the cost that we saw at the beginning of the session, you know, some of these uh, reputational and conduct issues have very large financial implications for firms that may ultimately affect their solvency. And we have experiences also on reputational issues of, of, of firms that were confronted with insolvency due to reputational, you know, and situations of conduct in which had, had serious implications for also the amount of capital available at the institution. So I do think that that has to be taken into account by prudential supervisors in the prudential assessment. And I also do think that they, they, they are doing that in an, in an increasing way, you know. So, Second aspect, you know, importance of certain business models and uh, whether those certain business models are more prone to reputational risks. I think that here, you know, one, one has to think about, the, or the way I think about it, there's, there's certain business activities that may be closer to maybe engaging in some kind of a specific risks, you know, and, and the most obvious example, for instance, would be if I give you examples like uh, correspondent banking. Uh, in many large jurisdictions in the last 10 years has been very much linked many times to the probably the higher risk of potential AML activities or things of that sort. You know, so therefore, uh, correspondent banking has been uh, an activity that a number of banks have decided not, con to, not to continue to pursue or pursue with a, a much more uh, high <coughs> or lower risk, lower risk uh, appetite. Uh, but beyond that, you know, I would say, you know, that, and, and I think that's what you were pointing to. For me, more than business models that have more and low uh, reputation and conduct risks, I think that the, the big challenge is having the right policies and procedures, and operating policies and procedures in the organization to make sure that you don't incur on those costs. I'll give you an example, for instance, you know. Some of the very large high-profile mis-selling cases in Western Europe at the retail level. And this were, some of them were mentioned again in, in the initial presentation, you know, like uh, in the UK, PPI is probably the most obvious one, but on, on selling of mortgage products or things of that sort, selling of some, some subordinate debt in some other uh, European countries. You know, these are practices that were performed by large and small institutions, you know, engaging in that business. You know, there were, there were practices that were widespread. Sometimes there were practices that were recognizable even in the culture of the organization, and that needs to be managed. You know, there are other cases in which you know uh, sometimes the organization is not uh, uh, clearly capable of having adequate controls to monitor that bad practices exist, and then we get scandals or situations in which the organization finds out of uh, improper engagement by somebody in the organization, you know, two levels that are surprising to them just because of lack of proper controls. So to me, it's more important rather than thinking that there are business models that are more or less prone 
to, to these kinds of contact risk, I would say that there are you know, internal management of those business models that are better or worse at having proper controls and proper management of those risks. Third aspect that you mentioned is digitalization, cyber risk, increases in the magnitudes for conduct. Here, I think that, you know, for me, one of the key uh, challenges that we will have going forward is that with this increase in digitalization and cyber, of course, this issue of cybersecurity. I'm not gonna not refer to that and operational resilience, which is very important. But for me, it's more another aspect, which is, you know, these uh, processes have three characteristics that make them more difficult to, to, to monitor, both from the regulatory point of view, but also from the, from the institutional, from the banks and the institutions point of view. One is the cross-border nature of it. Second is the speed at which the transactions takes place. And third, which is related to the second, but it's not the same, is the quickness and the intensity in which these potential, let's put the way, prototype technology can become a massive tool being used by a large number of customers or a large number of people in the organization. Those three things you know, make uh, the management of these uh, situations very difficult because from us, from the regulatory and supervisory perspective, of course, the first aspect you know, that it gets spread uh, on a worldwide basis, on an international basis very quickly, requires us a much, much more agile in communication, in coordination with other authorities within the Union, within the European Union and worldwide, in third countries. You know, also have better tools to be able to stop that or to be able to enforce decisions across border and with third countries. And that's a big challenge. And that's an area which a lot of work, I think, needs to continue to go forward. But the other two aspects are also concerns for the organization. You know, if an organization suddenly is very quickly moving forward an activity that gets very widely spread within a, 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 part, a large part of their customer base or their organization, then to be able to push back on that activity to if, once they identify that they might have unintended consequences or, or detrimental consequences, it's going to be much harder for them. So again, here, having proper ex ante procedures is going to become more and more important. I think that's what we are putting a lot of the emphasis at this stage. The last part that you highlighted was ESG, you know, and what happens as we go forward with non-compliance with ESG requirements. You know, here, of course, the challenge that we have is that in this area of ESG, we're in early stages. So we don't have a lot of very hard requirements that need to be complied. You know, at, at this stage, we're more in the identifying of proper taxonomy, proper data, and we will continue in the banking sector with our work and our work in the way we have planned it out starts by making sure that uh, banks uh, have mechanisms for proper disclosure, for proper assessing at the most senior level what's their strategy and what's their approach on these issues, and we'll come forward with a consultation paper on this by year end. And then we, we want to make sure that institutions are being pushed in having proper risk management techniques and tools to assess the risk and to have well-defined risk capitalists and risk procedures and controls. And that's a process that's going to continue going forward. I do think though, that over the medium term, it's not just the requirements will be imposed by the regulators and it will be requirements in the formal sense of the world, of the world. I think actually will be requirements imposed by society. And we already see that very much. You know, we already see very active ESG investors that are asking very good, valid, important questions to corporations in which they're considering investing, you know, but they are very valid and that, that is putting important challenges to these organizations. And they're actually the ones that are pushing in that direction in a very active way. So when I, when I think about requirements in this area, I tend to think that is the society actually that's gonna be requiring companies to be active in this front and probably in a faster pace than the regulatory environment itself. So I hope that's, that's true and that will certainly help companies move forward. Let me stop here. There were a lot of areas. I hope I, I tried to answer all of them, but I'm happy to come back to any of them that you, that you may want to pursue further. We are almost running out of time, but if I could take an extra five minutes, uh, I have a few questions uh, in, in the chat. One I would like to pick on is the importance of gender diversity. And uh, obviously, uh, it is a theme that I am studying closely. And the question is whether gender diversity is becoming a more important thing for regulators in combating misconduct. 
that. The uh, other answer, question I would want to, to ask uh, is uh, a colleague has asked, uh, are we running the risk that the regulatory book becomes uh, so big for banks that it becomes a compliance uh, uh, box ticking exercise, uh, a compliance culture where they follow formal rules, uh, uh, but then they gain the system. Would you have time to address these two questions? And, and finally, would you recommend either national competent authorities or individual institutions to actually adopt a more transparent uh, um, cost conduct uh, information like we are trying to do in the project? Quickly, and I'll do it in an in inverse order because okay. I think the first one clearly yes. I mean, I think that transparency in this area is a very important aspect. You know, and I think that uh, we, in general, at the ABA, have been very keen on transparency. As you know, we run and this is a completely different area on the prudential framework and the financial situation of banks. But every year, we run very large transparency exercises in providing information on banks. And I think in this area, we are we have not worked in the past actively, but I very much encourage your work. And I think this will be an important area. Uh, the second question that you asked me, you know, which is is, is the rule book too big? Uh, there's no question that, 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 that the amount and the quantity of financial regulation has increased tremendously, you know. And uh, I'm happy to consider, you know, that uh, there might be areas in which it's too big and too detailed. You know, part of the irony, for instance, at the European level is to be able to get agreement on what the common rules are, they need to be specified in a much higher detail at higher levels of the regulation than in other jurisdictions, mainly because, you know, there is, there is less confidence that in the implementation of the rules there will be common understandings across the union. So those rules have to be specified in a much more detailed manner. But more important, whether it's too big, I think the key point, and I think that's, that's, that's what the question is really pointing to, is, is it proper? Is it holistically integrated and well coordinated? So there are no, no, there are no obviously, contradictions or, or, or tensions pulling in different directions, so that it provides a holistic view of the firm and the risk engaged, you know, and the third part for me is it proportionate? Is it really addressing the right issues? And this comes back to the box ticking exercise, you know. Any kind of regulatory framework that's assessing risks, and it doesn't start from the point of view that this should be a risk-based analysis, but just a, a box ticking exercise in which I just tick the things without making proper assessment of the relative magnitudes and relative relevance of those different boxes for me as an institution, for me in my business, is, is not prone to be correct. And we need to make sure that that's properly balanced in that sense. Third question that you asked me, which is something that's, that's very dear to us, I think at ABA, is this issue of, of gender diversity and gender, gender balance. You know? I think that the, the key fundamental point that needs to be addressed is, first of all, that there's no biases. Implicit, explicit, I think that very people are very conscious on, on not having explicit biases, but I think there, there are implicit unconscious biases that are present in many organizations. And this just limits our capacity to understand situations, to understand problems. And I think on this issue of gender balance, you know, we need to recognize that we have had a large number of explicit, but also implicit unconscious biases, and those need to be removed. And we need to be able to look at the problems, including this problem with a much more broader perspective, and that will enrich us and I think that's an area in which we need to work. You know, uh, we are internally at the ABA in our own internal processes trying to make sure that we address that. We have put forward this issue to the, to the institutions as well. We have published actually a report uh, in the first half of this year, in the first quarter of this year, on the prevalence of women in organizations, mm -hmm. boards and in senior management, on the relation of that with remuneration, with performance. And, and, there is, there is a, a actually a, a, a positive correlation. I'm not, I'm not here in a business school, you understand this process very well. I'm very reluctant to say at this stage that we have identified a causality, but we do see a correlation between, between gender or, or, or proportion of, of, of females in boards and in senior positions, you know, and performance. But that's just a, at this stage, it's just a correlation. But I do think that beyond that, I say, you know, and we should not just think in terms only of of performance in terms of returns. As I said before, it's performance in having us better assess the environment in which we operate. The environments in which we operate, be our customers, be our risks, being our employees, 
you know, our stakeholders that will strongly enrich our decision making within our organization at the ABA, but also at the banks. So I think it's very much in our agenda. I know it's in the agenda of the European institutions, so I hope that we can pursue that further. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up. I want to invite Rim to say a few final words uh, uh, if she wants, but let me join you all in thanking uh, Mr. Campa so much for this very inspiring presentation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. It's a great pleasure to see you. And uh, I think uh, this conduct risk uh, will be on the top of, hopefully, in the agenda of the regulators. Uh, because it's also very much linked, as uh, Barbara mentioned, to transparency exercise. And the more we know about the balance sheets of banks, especially on the asset side, uh, the more we would understand this conduct risk in the medium to long run. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And again, congratulations on the work that you do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. A pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Bye.